In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I find that it helps me to read the resurrection accounts as are to be found in the various uh, Gospels and also uh, in that given by St. Paul to keep in mind what we Catholics, surely liberal Catholics, easily forget, namely that the resurrection of Christ is not so widely accepted as one might imagine, or let us say uh, many, many people not only do not accept the resurrection, but they vehemently and bitterly deny it. I speak mainly of the Jews who have great power on this earth, especially over men's minds through publications and the media, also the humanists who are generally atheists who on these subjects, that is any subject that bears on supernatural mystery and revelation, join with the Jews in uh, casting their aspersions and in uh, mouthing their disapproval and their denials. And then there is the great communist empire, which is at war with Christ and has as its purpose to destroy the church and to destroy the memory of Christ. I hope that no one is so ignorant that he is not aware that on the one hand there is an open alliance between international Judaism and communism, and on the other hand that communism and the Catholic Church are mutually exclusive so that communism cannot last if the Catholic Church lasts. As I say, it helps me personally in reading the accounts of the resurrection if I keep in mind that there are those who scoff at the idea that Christ rose. And it should help you also because you see things differently if you realize that there are those who question this whole idea. I ask you, therefore, let us allow in our considerations of the resurrection, let us allow for the possibility that the apostles made the whole story up. According to the arguments presented, the apostles simply could not accept the fact that Christ was such a colossal failure. And so completely had they immersed their lives in him and so totally had they put their faith in him that when they saw him destroyed by his enemies, after they got over the first shock, they banded together and formulated the story of his resurrection so that all would not be lost. The Jews would not believe this preposterous tale, but they found ready listeners among the Gentiles. And the thing developed far beyond anything they might imagine. Certain of these rationalists, as they are called, say that the original eleven apostles would never have made the story stick had it not been for the entrance upon the scene of Paul, the erstwhile Pharisee, 
It was Paul who, with his imagination and his great flair with words, developed not only the story, but also a whole theology surrounding this tale. Let me remind you now, I'm not making things up. These things are being said, and these things are even now uh, receiving some uh, circulation, some acceptance in so-called Catholic seminaries. Before most of us pass from this scene, we are going to see priests in parishes who are totally non-believing. But as I say, let us consider the story that is given. First of all, you must remember that the Gospels and the letters of St. Paul are primary sources. One has, therefore, to accept the fact that they have at least an historical acceptability. If you are unwilling to accept anything about the Gospels, if you are not willing to accept them as historical narratives, then, of course, uh, the story of Christ's resurrection is altogether to be discounted. But the problem is the Gospels exist. And for that reason, they have to be considered. Either they tell of eyewitness events or they are totally negligible. The thing about these stories is that we should ask ourselves, if they are all made up, would they have been made up as they were? If the story that is had been fabricated by these conspiratorial uh, plainsmen from Galilee, would they be presented in this fashion? Let me try to show you what I mean. According to the narratives, Jesus, when he arose, did not first appear to his apostles. Nor, curiously, did he first appear to his own mother. There is not a single word to the effect in these narratives that he appeared specially to his mother at all. We have no doubt that she saw him, but if we are to be guided only by these accounts and not by our sentiments, we are to infer that Mary saw him only as a member of the crowd and that our Lord's main attention was on the apostles and convincing them. But as I say, he did not even appear to them first. He appeared to Mary Magdalene first. And apparently, shortly thereafter, early in the morning, to other of the women. But the main account seems to have been that he appeared to Simon Peter still later in the morning. And then there was this problem about the fact that having heard about the resurrection, the apostles said nothing about it for 50 days. You would think that uh, they would not ever construct such a tale as that, that he appeared to them for a period of 40 days, off and on, unexpectedly, unpredictably, almost always surprisingly. But they never uttered a word of it until they had gone to Galilee for most of those weeks, and then they came down, apparently, 
for the Feast of Pentecost. And then is when they began to tell the story. And whereas before they were men of great fear, so fearful indeed that they uh, locked themselves in whenever they were in Jerusalem, and now after 50 days they are totally fearless. They cannot be silenced. And when they are punished for saying that Christ has risen, they brooded about all the more. And the most astounding thing about it is that they are willing and even do give up their lives for this preposterous tale which after they have proclaimed it far and wide, they have nothing on this earth to show for it but men's hatred, men's disbelief, and their scars. Then there is that curiosity about the tomb. In fact, the greatest curiosity about the tomb is how the apostles do not seem to have even remembered that Christ predicted his own resurrection, but his enemies remembered it very well. The day of Christ's death has not ended before they have succeeded in having Pilate grant permission to post soldiers lest the apostles steal the body and claim his resurrection so that his enemies take his words more seriously than his friends. His friends, indeed, on the day of his resurrection are not to be found expecting it, three days therefore, rather they are coming to anoint his body, to finish the burial rite which they were unable to uh, take care of on the day of his death. And then, according to the story of the soldiers, the, sol the apostles in the uh, depths of night stole the body away, themselves asleep. That is a hard story to believe because we must remember these are not soldiers of the modern American army. It was a foredrawn conclusion that any soldier who went to sleep at his post would be put to death forthwith, no questions asked. But these soldiers boast about their having been asleep. You could never get a soldier of any quality at all to admit that he had been sleeping, especially that he was sound asleep while these uh, fearful men crept up on this tomb, violated the seals for which there was a terrible penalty, rolled a stone of some tons away from the tomb and took the body, but curiously left the winding sheet there. Further, there is no word at all that his enemies ever investigated what happened to the body because the surest way to disprove all this talk about his having risen would be to produce the dead body and of course such things are not very easily hidden. Remember our approach my dear people it is not to prove that this story is true. The main emphasis here is to show you the unlikeliness of the story that the apostles told. Another example is before he appeared to the eleven, Christ appeared to two disciples. I mean that these two disciples were not 
members of the inner circle. They were on their way to Emos, and this happened toward sundown of the first day. Jesus, as you will read, simply joins them, and he remains uh, incognito so that they do not recognize him. And this is curious in itself. Why would they not recognize him? They recognized him a few hours later when he did appear. And when he did appear, he comes through the doors which have been closed and locked. Again, a noteworthy little facet. The Jewish leaders and the Roman government have no interest at all in the apostles because they are not a threat to anybody. And yet they, uh, in paranoid fashion, are slipping around the city and keeping under cover as if they are the next to be arrested. And so it goes. There are so many curiosities about the, the tale that the apostles produced that, as many writers say, the only thing about this tale that gives it any credence is the fact that it is true. Another example, you will recall that the angel, or whoever it was, it was sitting idly there in the tomb whom the women saw there, the angel says, go and tell the apostles and Peter that he goes before you into Galilee and he will see you there. And yet before the day is over, he has seen a number of them and even meets with all ten, Thomas being absent. Now again, would mere human beings have put things that way? They would have made sure that the story was perfectly consistent. And yet the angel says that he will see you in Galilee. And then Christ sees them that very day. And when you read the accounts, as I recommend during this week, the accounts of the various apparitions of Christ, keep that in mind. Namely, if someone were making up this story, would he possibly have included so many inconsistencies, so many surprises, and so many things that seem not to hang together. Liars would have sat around the table and made sure that before they began to tell the story, everything hung together neatly. There would be no questions let us say, no gaping loopholes, no unanswered questions. And there surely would have been no uh, conspicuous inconsistencies. To repeat the point, the only thing, the only explanation for this story as it is presented is that it is true, that it was not fab fabricated that the apostles simply told it as it was. And it is not a very uh, estimable story from their point of view because they look stupid. They look like dullards. They look as if the Lord Jesus really had a poor choice in all of them. Even to the last day of his being on earth, he is hammering home to them that he is really alive. And he scolds them for their disbelief. This is not the kind of thing that any liars would ever construct into their lie. 
And obviously there has to be a moral for us. And the story, I should say, the moral is that we have all the proof and it is just as hard for us as it is for them. We can no more easily deny that Christ now lives than they could. It was the apostles and the others who were the most demanding critics of the idea. As I say, his enemies did not even investigate the tale. They made no effort other than to pay the guards to squelch the story. Rather, they began to punish those who said it was true. Those who want to think about this further should, the next time someone dies, someone in their family, let them try to prove that this person has risen from the dead. To do so would be as easy as to prove that Christ rose if he did not. But, of course, we celebrate the feast not simply to analyze the story. We celebrate because, as I say, Christ lives. And it is because he lives that we celebrate, because he is our hope. Everything that has to do with our religion hangs on the truth of this story, this belief. And if Christ lives, there is not only a chance, but there is the fact that he is here and we are able to receive him as our food. It is only because he has risen that we dare to believe it. And it is only because he has the power to raise himself that he has the power so to come to us. And the reason we want him to come to us is because he has such power, the power over death, and the cause of death, which is sin. The reason why we want him to come is because without him we are lost. This is not just verbiage. This is the hard and sound truth. If Christ has not risen, we are without hope. We are terrible and pitiable fools. But if he has risen, then we have cause for our alleluias. We have cause for greatest joy because we will see him again and we will recognize him as the one who conquered death.